Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the reason we chose this uh, and kind of the history behind it. Um, the front suspension on a motorcycle is obviously important. Um, whether it, let's just say the front, what it connects the front wheel to the motorcycle is important. Um, and because not only does the front end or the fork, we call it, um, connect the wheel to the bike, but it allows the motorcycle to be pointed in different directions. It and also, it also allows also, it to be balanced. Right. Right. Good right. point. Um, you actually, that's how the motorcycle stays up is your, uh, your, um, balance of the bike using the steering. And there've been a number of different designs for the way that a front fork works. The first of which of course is the rigid front end that doesn't have any <laughs> suspension at all. And many, many of the earliest motorcycles had that many bicycles still do. So, uh, early bikes did not have any actual suspension on the front. It was just a rigid tube, like something like, like George Wyman, when he rode cross country, um, first person to, to ride a motorized yep. vehicle cross country did not have suspension on the front Crazy. and broke his handlebars because of it. Crazy. Um, but then they came out with different types of like Springer front end, which is a, actually a variety of leading link. Wow. Believe it or not. If you study the geometry, it actually is a very short leading link. We don't have time right now to go into all these different varieties, but uh, Springer front ends. We have girder front ends, which is a, another uh, design that allows the front end to absorb bumps in the road and maintain, and more importantly, maintain contact with the road surface between the tire and the road surface. Um, the telescopic fork went for, was, is, was, is kind of like the most common today. And the, the basic idea of a telescopic is if you look at a, a shock absorber, it's basically it's a shock absorber that doesn't have any external support. Interesting. So it, it's, it's literally just a giant shock absorber with the spring inside of it. And then it'll have, it also contains the, the damping fluid in there. Springers and girders typically, at least traditionally, did not have any damping, um, liquid damping. They may have had mechanical damping, which was accomplished by these plates that they would, you could adjust the tension on the plate and it would just provide uh, friction damping. Really? Which, which the, again, we don't have time to go into the, right. the, the reason why that isn't great. It does work as for damping. Uh -huh. It prevents like uh, oscillations, but it also just makes it harder for the suspension to work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, uh, so the first bikes, I believe BMW in the 1930s was the first motorcycle to come out with the production telescopic fork. And interestingly, they were also the first, they got rid of it. In the, I think it was maybe the 50s. I actually am not, I did not do my research on this. Yeah. I, they came out with a, a, a different kind of fork, which they stole from, uh, which they've kind of got a track record say, of classic, doing with suspension. Classic BMW? Classic is, BMW to suspension move. <laughs> um, but there was a, a man uh, in 1950. So they would, have, they would have been in the 60s probably that they, okay. that they stole it. But uh, Ernest Earls. Uh, and Ernest Earls, um, Hmm. Developed a, f a front suspension for the Douglas Dragonfly, which okay. is a British motorcycle, and it had uh, an, an early version of what, what we now know as leading link suspension. Um, the, his variety had the pivot point. Oh yeah, sorry, excuse me. The pivot point <laughs> instead of being here was all the way at the back on, oh, the, on the Douglas Dragonfly, and so when BMW uh, used that design. Um, on their motorcycles from, I think it would be like the 60s all the way up to, the, maybe it was only a 10-year period, but it, basically after the Earl's Fork up until the mid-70s, um, that's probably where most people are familiar with a leading link suspension is off of BMWs. Um, Interesting. And they were called, it's called an Earl's Fork. Right. And that's, uh, Earl's would just be a type of leading link. Okay. And it, the difference is that the pivot is all the way at the back rather than now, ha halfway up. Does that change like... Characteristics of yeah, it will have like a, it will have an effect on the on the on the the design. Yeah, um, this is superior. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's on a Janus motorcycle. Um, but uh, the 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 reason that we chose the this would be a good segue. The reason we chose a leading link is kind of a twofold. Um, the first is that the telescopic fork, which BMW went back to in the seventies, does suffer from some. Uh, issues uh and and, and it, it kind of we can illustrate them with the with the shock absorber the only way actually here we can illustrate with this yes this is, this is perfect well, this is a this is a telescopic this fork is a right? telescopic fork so the only way that this works is if these pieces overlap 
and the le and the more extended they get, the less they overlap. So it would be easier for me to break this thing here than it is to break it here. Okay. Because you got like six pieces of tube all stacked inside of each other. Right. But when you get out to here, they 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 can't fully extend. First of all. Yeah. Because if they did, they would it would fall, fall apart. apart. But also they would have no rigidity. You have to retain some overlap. Okay. But the further they overlap, or the further they don't overlap, the more pressure. If you if you apply a force like on you bend it like this, the the this part it's harder for you to actually I can't I see I can't huh, yeah I can't close it but if I don't put any pressure on it, it can, I can and that on in a in a, tel a telescopic work you have bushings and those bushings provide a, a slippery surface to even when it supposedly is getting pressure on it but it, it doesn't it's it's only as good as the design yeah right and so you do end up with what's called stiction. Uh, it's the scientific term for this <laughs> lateral loading on it, and um, that's one thing. Um, the other, the other issue with a telescopic fork is that there's, they're pretty difficult to manufacture. It's a very high precision um, piece, and typically manufacturers, unless they're really a big like Honda, or, I mean, I don't even know if Honda does it in all cases. They're gonna, they're gonna outsource the telescopic forks to a suspension expert that has the expertise to manufacture this very specialized piece of equipment, yeah. which, is, which is basically like a car suspension without any of the of the supporting of the A like arms or linkages, arm. exactly. It's none of that. It's just the shock absorber. Wow, that's imagine that, right? That's a that's a that's it's a, really a weird. Feat. Yeah, it's a feat. It's also kind of strange. Yes. So what we, what we those two factors the com, the complexity to the design and the fact that you needed to outsource it and these kind of um, features of the telescope before that can be kind of problematic um, led us to go with the leading link. The the last thing that, that, that ties in with the Stiction and the, the limitations of telescopic is that because it has no armature, no framework that it's that's supporting it, it when you slam the front brake on, the only thing it can do is compress. Right. And so what you end up happening is you have brake dive. So you slam the front brake on, and that thing is going to compress either a little bit or all the way, depending right. on how hard you you brake or how how the suspension is set up. And so what that then in, results in is changes in the whole geometry, the entire geometry of the bike. And because this is the front of your bike, that affects braking and more importantly, your steering <laughs> when you're going nah. through a corner. So the, your, your, the, the wheelbase of the motorcycle actually shortens and the rake changes. Interesting. Trail changes. A lot of things are changing. And because of the amazing quality of the human body and the mind and our reflexes, we can adapt to that. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of racers prefer that because they can feel that feedback. Um, however, there's a different way of doing it, and it's actually more similar to a car suspension yeah. um, where we actually have a mechanical whole framework, and then we isolate the suspension as a separate component. And so uh, one of the most important things with a, with a suspension system is that it provides a rigid alignment, really, especially on a motorcycle, between the rider and where they want to go so that that the way we ride it, the way we control a motorcycle is with a handlebar. Right. So you want the handlebar to have the least possible amount of deformation or bending compared to the wheel. You, right. you want to when you turn the handlebar a fraction of an inch, you want that wheel to turn exactly the same amount that you turn it. And if you can imagine two of these side by side <laughs> going around a corner, uh -huh. they don't necessarily want to go at the same rate especially if you hit a bump from the side. Right. And so the only way that they've been able to solve this with the modern motorcycle is either with a, sw um, a fork brace, which goes up over the wheel and ties the two together, or with the upside down suspension, which is popular today, and a massive axle. Mm. And that axle actually is trying to connect those two so that they can't do this. Yeah. That's why you, like a lot of like sport bike axles are just huge. Huge. huge and hollow yeah um because they are trying to kind of get around this inherent limitation of the telescopic yeah form. so anyway um we decided to just completely go a different direction because one for we're contrarians um at least i am as you should and be. uh and because we could manufacture this entire thing ourselves with our own processes just the same as we make a motorcycle frame and because we could leave the actual suspension portion the shock absorber itself like on a car to the experts. Yeah. So as many of you know, all of our shock absorbers are manufactured by Icon Suspension, the great 
Jeff Lowe down in Australia, who, we're, who we've, um, I've been working with him for literally since we launched the 250. So basically, we, we were able to isolate that and leave the, the suspension to an expert. And if you, let's say you find a better sock absorber, like you want to go Olin's or you want to engineer your own, you can just swap these out. Crazy. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Um, on top of that, we also have the, the, this dive issue that we were talking about with the telescopic fork. And the lateral loading thing, where it wants to, get, where you have to have this swing arm brace. If we use this system, which is we call the vertical and the horizontal, with a pivot right here, because really it's just a swing arm. This horizontal that goes around, sorry, right tools. You've got, you've got this, tools this, here. This horizontal is the fork brace. It's doing the same thing. It's going around. It's just not yeah. doing it over the top. It's going yeah. around the back. And so it provides that f that horizontal is a welded, very strong tube, absolutely minimal deflection. If you go, so that's why on something like a sidecar, which is, operates like a car, right? Yeah. It doesn't, you don't lean. So all the load when you go on a hard corner is just being pushed into the side of that wheel. Right. And so that's why most sidecars, Urals, BMWs, a lot of other gold wings, you see a sidecar, it's probably, if it's set up right, it probably has a leading link front suspension mm. of some kind because of that, that rigidity. The last thing is the anti-dive. And so this is probably the coolest thing about a leading link fork. Because you have a brake, I mean, if, if, this was, if, there, was, if there was no brake and you slammed the, well, you wouldn't slam the brake on, but if you were to hit a bump, it's just going to operate exactly like a telescopic fork. Typically, when you slam the brake on a motorcycle, what you... We, the MSF, what do they say? 70, 30. You want to have always when you're riding a motorcycle, you want to be applying more brake to the front wheel because that's where all the grip is. is right. As you when transfer you weight, weight, the rear wheel loses contact with the ground. And so you, that's why you always, even on cars, you're going to see the front brake rotor is a lot bigger. You are going to get suspension compression at the front and the bike's going to change the attitude toward the road and all those, all these different ge the geometry changes. However, because of this geometry, this, this amazing thing that just fascinates me about leading link is that you have a, we don't have a wheel on here or a brake rotor, but the brake rotor, if you don't attach it to the vertical, if you only attach the brake rotor to the horizontal, when you put the brake on, all the load of that goes into the swing arm. And it actually, if you engineer it right, counter, perfectly can counteract the forward compression of the, the suspension and it will just hold you perfectly neutral. It doesn't make no, it. It's passive. There's no energy. It doesn't make any it's completely sense passive. It's, it's magic as far it as I'm concerned. It is kind of magic. It is, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful, like, balanced system. Yeah. And so we, we went through a number of different versions. The first one that we did, we overdid it. And when you, put, when you would, like, touch the front brake, it would, like, hop off. <laughs> it, would, it would actually rise. And what we've done now is we've got a nice balance so that if, if you're in a... I always tell these people, and I don't know if people really understand what I'm saying when I say it, but if you're in a parking lot and you don't actually have any weight, any momentum, yeah. and you put the brunt brake on and you push the bike forward, it will rise yeah. slightly. And it really confuses people. People think that at a show, you go and they, they are used to, you put the brake on to hold the wheel and, and you push down to, to test the suspension and then it's like, it does nothing. And they're like, oh, uh, this is weird. It's pretty stiff. Pretty <laughs> stiff. Like, well, hold on. You, you, can't push, you can't put the brake on when you do it or, or you won't feel it. Um, but anyway, we, by, by, I think we went through a, Several, I can't remember how many versions we went through at this point, but we, we dialed it in so that it matches the actual, it counteracts the momentum and the, the compressive force when you, when you put the brake on so that it, you basically hold completely neutral yeah. with, the, um, with the compression of the bike under braking. Now, there are some trade-offs to this. The first one, if you're thinking about it, is you lose some fork compression there's some loss of travel mm. because you're constricting it with the brake is actually pushing against the suspension. Tr travel of the actual shock absorber. Shock absorber yeah. yeah. However, when you're under hard braking, the force increases against that. So it actually does balance out. But it's, it, I mean, everything, even, I mean, a, a well-engineered telescopic fork does a really good job. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that they don't. There's a reason why most modern motorcycles, their main reason is that they're ex inexpensive to manufacture yeah. and they're, they're simple. Yeah. Um, however, um, the, I, I, it, it is my opinion that the uh, leading link does a better heads up. The compromise is a better compromise. Um, so, so if you had to, to distill it down, yeah, 
telescopic fork versus leading link suspension? Like what are, what are pros and cons? Pros of the telescopic are it's really simple. It doesn't look complicated. And probably the most important thing is it's really conventional mm. and everybody's familiar with it. All the manufacturers make them. Customers are used to seeing them. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things I was afraid of when we launched it was, are people just going to think this is ugly? Yeah. You know? Um, of course, I didn't really care, but... <laughs> <laughs> it really didn't matter. I just was wondering. <laughs> I was wondering. I was a little, like, nervous. Um, but uh, the benefits of the... Um, how many, what other ones there would be? I mean, it, there, there's all the big engineers, like motorcycle suspension designers, are, have put their best thought into it at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, uh, on, the, on the leading link side, it's perfectly rigid in terms of lateral loading. There's no need for upside down forks. There's no need for a fork brace. Um, it has this anti-dive uh, tendency. And I guess the other thing that, to complement the telescopic is a lot of racers and more proficient riders have just gotten used to the feedback right. that that dive offers. And I'm not going to downplay that. And then I think a lot of people, if they're used to a, a BMW Earl's fork, they will claim that a leading link is a little bit sluggish. But if you've ever ridden a Janus, you know that, that if it's done right, it, it, it's not slight. It's a very nimble bike. Right. So I think we've blown that misconception out of the water. If you're interested in learning more about motorcycle suspension, frame geometry, and dynamics, here are some great resources. If you're interested in more content like this or participating or asking questions live, check out our weekly Ramble stream, which happens every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and other social platforms.